When we talk about thermodynamics, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about enthalpy. And whether we use the term enthalpy or we just talk about heat of reaction in our classroom, uh, we, we tend to talk a lot about the heat released during a chemical reaction, the heat absorbed during a chemical reaction. It wasn't until the last couple of years I actually introduced the whole concept of entropy and spontaneity into my general chemistry classroom. Of course, I taught it in my advanced class for a long time. It's not that as difficult to teach as I thought it would be. Uh, I kept thinking about thermodynamics and, and calculations and Gibbs free energy and thought, how am I going to teach that to the lower level chemistry students? I don't have to teach all that to the lower level. All I have to talk to them about is whether something happens or not at its own, happens on its own, we call that spontaneous. If it's spontaneous, it happens, and if it's not spontaneous, it doesn't. We don't have to go into a lot more detail than that. So I'm gonna give some detail that I wouldn't give to general chemistry students, and the rest of it would apply to any level. But we talk about delta H. Delta H is our enthalpy in a reaction, and the students know, and, and we try to avoid using too many words that make it sound like molecules have feelings, but the students know that reactions tend to happen so that the molecules can be at a lower energy state when they're finished. Molecules want to have lower energy. Okay, I make sure that students know that they're never allowed to use those terms in descriptions because molecules don't have feelings, but the world tends toward lower energy states, so that means that a chemical reaction that loses energy, has a negative enthalpy, is more likely to be spontaneous than a reaction that gains energy. Okay, so losing energy is sort of a, a favored thing. Doesn't make it spontaneous necessarily. So we gotta look at something else. We gotta look at something we call delta S or entropy. And depending on the level of your student, you may not want to introduce that, that symbol there because that frightens people away. You can use the word entropy. I think many kids have heard the word before. Uh, one of the words we use in its place is disorder. And I know all the thermodynamics people in the world would probably be very upset about me using that term. But the students seem to understand it. And they also seem to understand that things tend to be, it's more likely that something is disorderly than orderly. I often use my desk as an example. How many different possible ways are there for my teacher's desk to be in perfect order? Well, one. Actually, often they say none, because it's never in perfect order. How many ways are there for my desk to be in disorder? Well, heck, that's infinite. So disorder is more likely, okay? If you don't want to use, if you're uncomfortable using that, that imprecise term, is call it entropy. The universe tends toward higher entropy. So a gain in entropy would be positive. So therefore, if you're losing energy and gaining entropy, obviously it's gonna be spontaneous because both of those are favored processes. By the same token, if we, if we gain energy rather than losing it, so if we have a positive enthalpy, and if we become more orderly or less entropic, so we lose entropy. I'm not quite sure that's the right verb to use there. But if we gain energy and we become, have less entropy, then no, it's not gonna be spontaneous. There we go. What happens though when these two things aren't, aren't easily spelled out? For example, if a reaction loses energy and decreases in entropy, or if a reaction gains energy and increases in entropy. Okay. This is the one that's likely to be spontaneous, and this is the one that's likely to be spontaneous, but it's paired with something that's not likely to be spontaneous. So that's one we have to talk about, well, some things we have to know a little more information about. And we talk about uh, boiling water. Boiling water, let's see. Um, does that gain heat or lose heat? Well, I have to turn on the stove to boil water. So the water has to gain heat to boil. But we're going from a liquid to a gas. So the water is becoming more disorderly or getting more entropy. So is boiling water spontaneous? 
Well, yes, if it's 100 degrees Celsius, and no, if it's 50 degrees Celsius, at least at standard pressure. So what, does, what do these things depend on? They depend on temperature. Okay, so we talk a little bit about our thermodynamic data like that. Now let's come back over here and take a look at some processes and see whether they're spontaneous or not. Now this is something I use when we talk about solutions as well, but it is one of the kids' favorite demonstrations to see. What I have in this flask is a whole bunch of sodium acetate and a little bit of water. It's a super saturated solution. Now that recipe can be found in many places, uh, and I think it's going to be in the handout for this. Um, when you put the sodium acetate and the water together, it just makes kind of a wet sodium acetate. It doesn't look like this at all. The substance has to be heated and then very gradually cooled so as not to disturb. Uh, basically what I tell students is we fooled the solid into staying in solution. It's really not supposed to be there, but we fooled it. So what we have is, right now we have a lot of entropy because when ions are in solution, they're moving around, they're not attached to each other, they're just, they've got a lot of entropy. It is at room temperature. Sometimes I'll have a student come up and confirm that. You're going to take my word for it. Now, if I disturb that, and what I'm going to do is very carefully take the lid off. I found that this, oh, starting already. Never mind, I didn't need the seed crystal. We got that? What's happened? I've disturbed the system and it's crystallizing. Students want to call that freezing. It's not freezing, it's coming out of solution. What happened to the entropy here? Well, let's see, I had free flowing ions in an aqueous solution. That's pretty disorderly. Now what do I have? I have a solid. Okay, so I've, I've lost entropy. We've got much more order now than we had before. Then I have a student come up and feel it. So we've got negative entropy. And I have a student come up and feel it. It's warm. It is very warm. So I also have negative enthalpy. So if they look back to their chart, they see that two negatives, is, are two negatives spontaneous? Well in this case, yes it was spontaneous. And it was spontaneous at room temperature. We lost a lot of heat. It's very warm. And we, gain, we lost a lot of entropy in the process. Now, where's the practical use for this? Hand warmers. Hand warmers are chemical, uh, are packs of chemical. They're packs of sodium acetate. And they're sealed. And they're, so they're reusable. What we have here is another example of a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. I'm going to turn this upside down so we can see the uh, package better. Inside there is a metal disc and the metal disc has a little scratch in it to give those crystals a place to form but I've got to bend the metal disc to make this work. So I'm going to crack that metal disc and then we can see the crystals forming right there in the pack and in the process it gets very warm. Now what have we done? We've decreased the entropy and we've decreased the enthalpy. It's very warm, it's released a lot of heat. In fact, it would be uncomfortable to hold that for very long. Okay. So we talk about spontaneousness uh, when we're talking about, and we, when we bring in both entropy and enthalpy. Now, I don't always do these demonstrations together, but one of the things that um, I, I like to emphasize in my classroom is that energy is released when chemical bonds are made. That's very important to teach to students. One of the biggest misconceptions that students have, and I don't want to blame the biology teachers, but I think it comes from biological concepts, is that when bonds are broken, energy is released. We've all seen biology textbooks that show ATP, and when we break that bond and make it ADP, they even draw lightning bolts sometimes in the textbook. Energy is released. That's not true. The, the breaking of ATP into a, ADP involves other complex reactions, involves some bonds formed and bonds being broken. What I want my students to learn is that when bonds are formed, energy is released. Here's an example of ions that are free 
And when they come together and form that ionic bond in the solid, then the energy is released. So we've decreased in entropy, we become much more orderly, but we formed a lot of bonds. And we formed so many bonds that the exothermicness of this makes up for the fact that we've decreased in entropy. So it's, it's a balance. And which one becomes more important? <laughs>